Good evening, everyone. We're glad to have you here with us as we look at the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, and we'll be in chapter three. Uh, and we're talking about the theme of what to take off as Christians from our life of thinking and practicing, what habits and what to put on. And we're at the point in Paul's letter um, where he's giving them some application. Uh, once you make these changes in your life and you take off those old things and put on new things, what's next? And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we, we talked earlier uh, in, in our discussion last week um, from Colossians 4, excuse me, Colossians 13, verse 14, where Paul wrote, beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So Paul has given guidance on how to change our old uh, worldly behavior, uh, new attitudes that we should have to be like Christ. And then he added these three things to put on love, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, uh, and the opportunity that we have to be thankful. So now he's going to go into uh, applying this to the new self, pointing to actions that would help sustain our new and growing life in the body of Christ. This reminded me during uh, the week of kind of a, a view that, that, that people had in, in Bratislava of of Roman. You know, Roman is the, the evangelist there. He studied at Sunset and he, he graduated uh, from their distance learning program. And he's very um, evangelistic. And people in the congregation would, would kind of chuckle to themselves that if you gave uh, Roman a hug, the gospel would come out. Uh, because that, that's just the way he was. And those of you who, who had a chance to talk to him know that spirituality and, and the importance of coming to know Christ um, is something that is an extreme uh, part of his life. And so naturally, uh, being an introvert and traveling with him, I observed many interesting things uh, about uh, his way of life, one of which was if, if he was at a public bus stop, he, he knew everybody there before we got on the bus. Uh, and looking for opportunities to, to put in a word uh, for Christ, not necessarily preaching the gospel in every case, because that's not the beginning in every relationship. But Paul here is, is going to be looking in that direction. How do we respond uh, to the changes that God's going to work uh, in our lives? So in verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, uh, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness uh, in your hearts to God. There, there's a parallel passage uh, to these words and instructions in Ephesians chapter 5, and it's useful uh, as you uh, look at both of them to compare because it's, the instructions are, are quite similar and it's a reinforcement. So let's take a look at chapter 5 in Ephesians and look at 18 through 21. Uh, Paul starts out from a different perspective uh, leading into the same subject, um, but let's talk about that. In verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking and make, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another uh, in the fear of Christ. Does, does someone have a different translation in verse 18 for the word dissipation? Is that, do you use that word? Debauchery, oh my goodness. Dissipation and debauchery are probably not two words that we commonly use. What's the idea there? What comes to your mind in your study of dissipation or debauchery? Sensualness of, a, of an evil or a, a contrary to God's will perspective. Uh, that's the idea here. Uh, he, he comes to, uh, in verse 18, a contrast, uh, getting drunk with wine, 
which is an example of the dissipation. And the opposite of that is what? Being filled with spirit, okay? So that's how Paul introduces a similar instruction to the church in Ephesus, but he introduced it differently uh, to the church at Colossians. Uh, instead of being filled with the spirit, what does he say you're filled with? In, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. The word, the word of Christ. Uh, so this is uh, where Paul is in his application uh, of our changed life. He, he's, he's pointing out those things that will lead us into that changed life, that life like Christ that we are uh, hoping to develop in, our, in ourselves quickly rather than, than slowly because of the spiritual uh, as well as physical benefits of that. And so he starts out in verse 13, let the word of Christ uh, richly uh, dwell within you. Uh, what do you think of when Paul says, uh, let the word of Christ richly dwell or dwell richly in you? What, what comes to your mind? What does that mean that his word would richly dwell within you? You would have an abundance of it. This is the idea. Someone else? We would be thinking about it, pondering the word of God constantly. Okay, a constant consideration, pondering of the word of God. You have an abundance of it. Anyone else? Growth. Growth. Okay. Who said that? I didn't. Aha. Okay, Jim. All right. This is talking uh, uh, about a growth and increasing. Uh, why do you suppose he uses the word richly? Hmm. Do people normally thinking of, think of getting rich by the indwelling of the word? Sometimes, perhaps. Maybe we associate that word with other things. Uh, Jimmy? Okay. Enrich, that idea uh, is the same meaning basically, but it gives us maybe the, the application in this text uh, clearly. The word dwell means to inhabit uh, or to take up residence. Uh, one commentary I, I, I read, the guy said, the word of Christ makes its home among us. Our hearts ought to be the kind of place where God's truths just fit in. Uh, that's an interesting way to think of it. Have you ever gotten to the summer months like we are now? And you go to your closet and you find out that your last summer's clothes have gotten smaller and you're wondering, is there something about this closet that causes my clothes to shrink? Uh, <laughs> and, and so we don't fit as well as we used to fit. And it, the idea here might might uh, be parallel when our life begins to change and move in that direction. The word of Christ fits, okay? And if you put on those old clothes that don't fit, how do you feel? Uncomfortable. Change leads to discomfort, okay? Making these changes in our life will lead to di discomfort, but he helps us by pointing out the richness that is uh, in store for us by allowing the word of God to dwell uh, within us. It will uh, change our hearts. So how do you enable uh, the rich dwelling of Christ's word? How do you enable the rich dwelling of Christ's word? If we're going to do this, we, we need to know how. You got to read and study. So you've got to study it and immerse yourself in the path that he wants you to go. These are um, necessary parts. Someone else? Yes, Ken? Exactly. Yes, that covers that you, you, you're taking out and you're putting in. That, that which is not benefit, benefit, beneficial goes out and that which is, comes in. Yes, Jimmy? Yes. Our thinking processes have to be consistent with what God has established. So the, the point in looking at this at the very beginning, it's, it's not new to Paul's writing either here or, or in his other, uh, other letters, is this, this is not a passive thing. 
The word of God does not richly dwell in us because we are passive, all right? Now, James, in James chapter 2, going back to the book that Ken referred to, uh, James lets us know that even the demons know the word of God. Now, would you say that it richly dwells in them? Now, I'd say it's pretty sour dwelling. Um, because what does the word of God say to them? Tremble. Remember when Jesus would meet, like for example, in the Gospel of Mark, he would come across these demons, remember? Some of them, the, the 2,000 uh, that he came across, what was their concern? Yes, they were concerned now that something was going to happen they already knew about that would be a judgment of some sort, or perhaps you might say as a punishment or a limitation. Uh, they had their preferences. They, demons preferred uh, certain things. Uh, and what we find in Paul's writing is this is not a passive uh, process. It's active, and sometimes it will be painful. But there will be a richness to it, uh, as we go on, so I would say, first of all, we need to know it. Second of all, we need to apply it, okay? And let me ask you this. When did you, in your Christian service, find yourself learning more about the Word than ever before? During hard times, okay? Some of the circumstances that come to us will help us to turn back to the Word and appreciate the Word, someone else. When I'm teaching others, here are two quite serious experiences uh, where you are, are challenged to go back uh, and, and look at God's word. And part of it might be when you're having troubles is, where did I get off uh, the, the narrow road? Or uh, what has happened to my mind as it watered? But especially I have found in teaching, I learn a lot more when I'm teaching. What, what would you say is the reason you learned more when you were teaching, for example, Gene? You've got to know it in order to tell somebody else. One of the things I found in my classes, especially the one uh, in, in Enumclaw, is they managed to ask some of the most difficult questions. You know, that if there's something odd in a passage and you kind of skip over it, uh, they won't. Yeah, you know, and so you, you have to study a little harder because you have to anticipate there are 16 people in there, every place on the map concerning knowledge of the Bible, what are they going to ask? And so I got this notebook that's about this thick, uh, alphabetically listed all the potential things they might ask with a little paper uh, so that it, it's beneficial to them not simply uh, easier for me. So what I, I would suggest that you look at here um, in what Paul is telling us, uh, if you want the word to richly dwell within you, you need to know it, you need to apply it, and you need to teach it. Uh, and when these things are uh, happening, uh, for example, in, in Jimmy's case, when he's talking about difficulties in your life, that's where the applying it questions. You remember all the nation, times the nation of Israel wandered off the path and got into worshiping other gods, and what did God do? He punished them. How did he punish them? Yes, he allowed other nations to come in and persecute them, and they were forced to stop and ask themselves, uh, what's going on here? That doesn't mean they always did or that they came to the right conclusion. But the point is, God gives us an opportunity, okay? So uh, we have experienced the grace and the peace of God uh, when we become Christians. That's, that's one of the things that we need to be aware of. Can you say that you've experienced the grace and the peace of Christ? What does that mean to you? I've experienced the grace of God. I've experienced the peace of God. God, because what are you going to get in the world that fights against that? Hmm. What's going to happen? Yes, Ken? This is an important idea. When we are not at peace with the fact that our biggest eternal problem has been solved, which is what? Sin. You know, here we, we get distracted by everything. It's not like these things aren't 
uh, important, but the biggest problem we have has been solved. And so Satan wants to change our view of that. What's he going to tell us? Lies. One of his lies might be, well, you really didn't get God's grace because you're not worth it. Whoa. Know some reasons why you can answer back, I'm not worth it, but Christ died for me anyway. And if he was willing to give his life, God has put value on my life to give his son. So we've got to be prepared uh, to realize that when we make our uh, journey through the world, um, what does grace mean to us? What does the peace of Christ mean to us? Because these are what uh, opens up our life and our, and our heart to the word of Christ, where we, have, where we feel at home with it, okay? We are, we are at home with the, the peace that comes in knowing that we no longer are separated from God. And whatever sin we commit, do we get baptized again? Why not? We repent. What does he say that we should do in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7? Don't lie. Don't lie about what? Don't lie about your sin. Instead, verse 9, confess your sin to the Father, to the Father and he is what? He's faithful. You know, we, we want to be faithful. And we pursue faithfulness. But God is really the faithful one. Because if we'll confess, he is faithful to forgive us. This is what we need in this journey as we've gotten to this point in Colossians. In, uh, in, in the passage that Ken read in James, look back at James chapter 1 one more time. Because there's a, there's a lot of important information in there that is related uh, to, to what we're talking about. Of course, in, uh, in uh, verse 21, we looked at, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness, with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James is writing to what people? Christians, they are probably what ethnic group? Probably Jewish. And yet he says something here. The implanted word which is able to what? You mean their souls weren't saved? Uh-huh. This is an ongoing saving. In other words, in 1 John chapter 1, John speaks of it in verse 7. He speaks of the blood of Christ like a stream. And as long as we are walking in the light, that stream cleanses us. It's continuous. So what does it mean walking in the light? Pardon me? Same thing. Yes. It's present, it's present tense. We are seeking to have a right relationship with God. When we fail, we what? We repent. We ask for forgiveness. Now, if you step out of the stream, guess what? You're in trouble. You need to ask for repentance as the nation of Israel had to do and get back in, okay? Um, but the blood is there to cleanse us. We need to, to be open to this because uh, it's, it, the, the, the word of God implanted word, the one that dwells within us, within us is continually providing the truth that we are saved by the blood of Christ. Jimmy? That's exactly right. That's why I, I, I came to this passage that Ken originally mentioned, because we need to know it, that's for sure, but we need to apply it. And that's what he's telling us here. Uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If all you are is a hear, hearer, you've done what? Okay, he uses a word here that's important. You are doing what to yourself? You're deceiving yourself, okay? Uh, you're, you're thinking that knowledge is the end of it. But um, this is not the end. When we meet people, we, we, generally, we generally say in America, how are you doing? Do we really want to know? Hmm, not always. Foreigners have figured that out. People travel with me said, they don't really want to know, do they? And I said, well, sort of. Uh, they sort of do. But the idea, what if, what if we asked 
in the spiritual sense, concerning the word of God, how are you doing? What does that mean then? We're not, we're not patting everybody on the back simply because they know something. Who do we know that can quote the, the verses and it hasn't helped them? Satan, in the, event, in the two accounts of the temptation of Jesus, he quoted verses to the word. Jesus is the word. And Satan, I think maybe so blinded, he thinks he can fool the one who is the word. But what's he hoping for? Distraction will get the best of Jesus. But Jesus had known the word, and he applied the word, and he taught the word. So when Satan faced him with a lie, he could say, that's a lie, all right? So these are one of the things that we're talking here about applying this. Paul is wanting the Christians to realize it's not enough just to, to clean up your life a little bit here and there and get rid of the obvious things. Um, some people were talking about visiting assembly. Uh, and they said, um, I feel uncomfortable because all those people are so holy. And I said, if you could see with the eyes of Jesus, you wouldn't be worrying with, about it at all. It's not that, that we aren't seeking to be holy. We just aren't. Apart from what? Christ, the blood of Jesus. Uh, and so some people are hesitant because they don't know what really is going on in our lives. All right. And so some of this teaching it involves letting people know you're on the same journey. You may not be at the same place, uh, but he wants them to, to realize uh, where the blessing comes. Uh, look in verse James chapter 1, verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Notice he says he looks into the perfect law of liberty and what? continues in it okay uh he this one will be blessed in what he does where does the blessing of god come in the doing the blessing of god comes in the doing okay it's are we saving ourselves by our doing no we're not we're not it's just that there's a connection between knowing the word and doing the word that is essential uh, and he wants us to see that it's by the grace of god uh, we know in ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 we're saved by what through but we're saved in verse 10 to do what do good works which god has planned in advance for us to do so the we get a blessing certainly simply the the uh, the very beginning, the blessing of freedom from our sin and relationship to Christ. Um, but we don't have the indwelling of Christ if we don't know it, uh, apply it, and we'll find greater uh, understanding and blessing as we teach it and we share it with other people. So when we're here in, in Colossians, uh, in chapter 3, um, at the end of uh, verse 16, we see the result of a community of believers who have their hearts and their minds richly filled with the word of Christ. So go back. If you're not there, I moved away. So I'm going to go back to, oops, I'm not going to go that place. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Look, look at verse 16 again. Uh, but let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So how does Paul apply this result of a community of believers who have their hearts and minds uh, richly filled with the word of Christ? What's his application here? There's a one another thing going on here. They're strengthening one another. They're holding one another up. Uh, there's been a, 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 perhaps a change in their focus, 
in, in Philippians chapter uh, 2, verse 5 through 11, Paul starts out by saying, think of others. What? In what way? In comparison to yourself? Better than yourself, okay? This is the change of heart that comes with the word that dwells within us. We begin to be more and more like Christ. We begin to have a, a changed uh, lifestyle. Uh, so out of hearts filled with God's spiritual truths, Christians teach one another whenever instruction or admonition is needed. What's the difference between instruction and admonition? Okay, instruction can be giving the information, whereas admonition, uh, you, you may be challenging them or admonishing them uh, to live it or to change their life and follow it. Jimmy, were you going to add something else? That's the same thing? Okay, so in, in, in this particular uh, situation, the, the Word of God within our hearts enables us uh, in all wisdom uh, to teach and admonish one another. What do we use in our teaching and admonishing one another according to this verse? Pardon me? Word. The word. Which application of the word? He, he shows us here, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So if we're going to encourage and admonish one another, what has to be true of these hymns uh, and psalms and spiritual songs? Yeah, this is what you were saying initially was, uh, it's got to be the word of God, but we're using an opportunity uh, to share the word of God that some people might not pay attention to or might not real, re realize is beneficial. When I was working in Bratislava, um, we had aimers, our aim teams mostly had boys, young men, you would say. The aim teams in Eastern Slovakia mostly had young women. So we had mostly young men in our response because of the working of, the, uh, of that relationship, and they had mostly young women. And one time we had a gathering on a Sunday of all the aimers, and we had a special assembly, and we encouraged them to invite their friends. And they were a little bit shocked because mostly they heard men's voices on our Sunday assembly. And suddenly, they've got all these women voices. And it, is, it was so beautiful. It, it would bring tears to your eyes. And they were touched by it as well. The young men who came here, to our assembly. They were impressed by the power of the singing that we had on that Sunday because they were words that were relevant to our life. They were words based on what? The scripture. So music is so powerful. How have you seen the power of music? I mean, that was one way I saw it, but how have you seen the power of music? Exactly. Now and then, I'll try to sing a Slovak song. Uh, and it's, as soon as I get started on it, then I can identify all the things that are associated with that. Have you ever had a song come on the radio and you start associating events or times with that song? There's a powerfulness to that when what you're teaching, as Jean said, is the word of God. Uh, it, it, to me, it was uh, so sad to visit uh, several groups of people who, who had a big band on the stage. I mean, it was so loud. I was thankful I was about 20 rows uh, in the back. It reminded me of a concert I went to up at Fifth Avenue, and I'm going, this is not the music I remember on the radio, because uh, it was so loud it hurt. Uh, and you couldn't hear anybody singing. Uh, and I'm not saying they weren't sincere. What I'm saying is what a powerful difference there was when people were singing to one another. Did you ever do that? I kind of look around. You, you do that? I, I kind of look around. We're singing to one another. And in our songs, he says here, um, 
that we are teaching and admonishing one another. Uh, now, Psalms typically refers to what? The books in the Old Testament, or the book in the Old Testament where there was a collection of those Psalms written uh, during the, the, the times of um, Moses and after through the kingdoms. Uh, we still sing them. We just uh, have our tunes to them, but the words are still there. Spiritual, well, hymns would be what? Opposite of hers, right? <laughs> no, hymns would be what? Okay, so, can be songs from a song book. All right. Does anybody have a more technical difference between them? Psalms and hymns? They have a spiritual. Mm -hmm. praise, praise and stuff. Yes, yes. The other, the other expression, spiritual songs, uh, tended to talk about something maybe more spontaneous or contemporary. However, it's not always valuable to try to separate uh, expressions like this because they may be simply another way of saying the same thing. Uh, and so the idea that they have in common is what? the word of God, okay? Some of them might be more praise and joy. Uh, some of them, some of the Psalms, you know, are quite sorrowful. Um, they involve mourning and, and showing uh, our, our repentance, for example. Uh, but any of these three are songs that we can use to teach and admonish one another. Uh, he, um, the, the Apostle Paul wrote passages that are considered or included passages in his writing that are considered to actually be songs from the first century for example turn to philippians chapter 2 and look at verse 5 this is a an important uh, passage of, of scripture but uh, people who who have looked at the historical writings uh, and the meter for example of the words think that this was part of a song in the first century church. But let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now that's a powerful song. Do we have any song like that? Anybody recall one? That would be a great song to sing. It's a summary of the gospel right there. And so that's the idea of these spiritual songs is to take such powerful words and put them, uh, uh, attach them to a, a tune uh, and a meter that it helps you to remember them, okay? So uh, something happens uh, when you begin to permeate yourself with the, the word of God. Uh, the word that's stored up in you will more naturally flow out uh, because of the fact that, you know, it has become such a major part of, of your spiritual life. Uh, and some of it will be praise to God. Uh, and these things might even uh, become part of your conversation from time to time uh, as you're speaking to people. This is what Paul is saying, allowing our minds to be changed with spiritual truths that result in our uh, sharing the word of God, admonishing, instructing uh, the word of God to people even through singing. Uh, and it recognizes the power that comes from that kind of communication. Uh, and so, have you ever heard anybody say, uh, it, this happened when I was in Slovakia, well, we sing the same songs. They're, these are old songs. And they'll look down and they say, well, look, at this was written 200 years ago. Well, 
What does that say? That stood the test of time. What else? It's got a powerful message. And maybe we've been a bit lazy in writing new songs. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to have songs that we know. We really sing out. Okay. And maybe we used to have a time on our singing practice day where we would learn new songs. I think that's a good idea to learn new songs, but you also have to have someone who's willing to write them, who understands the, the music and the words and, and all of that. And so if, if, if we're concerned that the songs are too old, we might ask ourselves, is it just the words? Are we singing songs that aren't biblically true? Have you ever sung a song and you thought, hmm, that's not in the scripture? There have been a, a few times uh, I've, I've thought of that. I wonder what they meant by that. Uh, and so it's some songs in that one song book, was it Sacred Selections? Which song book was it where it changed all the words? Anybody remember that song book? No, okay, good, you forgot it. <laughs> it was Sacred Selections? Okay, because there, there were some really favorite songs we had and we all go, what? They changed the words. Uh, I think the one that, I, that stood out to me was when we, when we sang, When We All Get to Heaven. And someone said, we're not all going to heaven. And I said, <laughs> pardon me? Yeah, so they changed it when the saved get to heaven. But the implication in the word was that you were singing about the saved, okay? But, it, you know, it didn't offend me that they wanted to make sure that message was known. But this is important. Singing is so important uh, in our communication. It has such a power effect on us and on other people, then we need to think about uh, new songs and learning to, new song, to have new songs. Uh, someone was concerned in, in Bratislava um, that, that we weren't singing well enough. And so we said, well, let's have someone come in and give us an a cappella singing uh, like a lectureship or a continuing training in songs, new songs and how to sing a cappella and how to read notes and all that kind of stuff. And someone said, why don't we just advertise it and see if anyone else wants to come? And lo and behold, half the people there were from other religious communities who wanted to learn how to sing a cappella. And there was a group, uh, especially from uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, who sing a cappella often. I don't know that they do every time, but they came, started coming to a Bible study I had, and uh, they shared some of their recorded a cappella songs with me. And so the, the idea here um, is that we have an opportunity to improve in something that God said he wants us to do, and how it can be a tool to reach out and communicate to people, perhaps who've never heard of the idea. If you survey the average person about how common is it for a church to sing in a cappella, what do you think their answer would be? Not very often. Do you know how long ago it was that nearly everybody sang a cappella? Okay. Yes. Right, exactly. You know, the instrumental music didn't become common uh, until after 1000 uh, AD. You know, before that, for a thousand years approximately. Now there were here and there. The, the first musical instrument was an organ and they weren't the kind like we have today. Uh, and the second thing was a trumpet. And of course, I always think of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, uh, hear that trumpet. Uh, and what does it mean? The Lord's coming. When I was in Bear Valley, their, their church building, there's a highway that ran across just about like this. And, and the guy was preaching on the second coming of Christ and a car went by and blew its horn and everybody jumped <laughs> like, oh, we have instrumental music in the church today. Uh, but the idea was uh, to go back and to find in God's word, um, songs that we can sing, songs that we can um, put um, music to, and, 
share with people simply with our voices the message that um, God has given us in his word. Um, the next verse, he talks about, uh, going back to Colossians chapter 3, the next verse, Paul continues with the, the application of our new life in Christ. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So uh, there are three essential uh, guidelines given in this verse uh, to the new life we have, uh, in, well, not, the, not to this verse, but in the verses that we've looked at, three essential guidelines uh, to apply to the new life we have in Christ. We've seen the first was, let the peace of Christ rule in, in your hearts. The second was, let the word of Christ dwell within us. And the third is, to let the name of Christ be our central uh, concern. What do names mean in our modern society? Is there, why do people get certain names? It identifies them. I have the initials of my father, R-E-S, but my mom didn't want me to be named after my father because then you have to have a junior or a second or something like that. So uh, I had a different name that started with R. So it's kind of a, a family thing. Other people, my sister, older sister, was named after my grandmother. Uh, and so these kind of things happen. In the, in the Old Testament, how do people get their names? Not all the same, but occasionally, how would they get a name? Occupation, Occupation would tell you. Mm -hmm. What else? <clears throat> Sisana, they would have a family name uh, that would be related to their, their ancestors. Uh, and so what, remember when, um, when John the Baptist was born? Oh, was he the one? Yeah. Then yeah. they were going to they were going to name him. Yeah. And someone said what? Name no one's named John in your family. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so but our culture is not so strong that way. We we have all kinds of names and, and we have some even that are uh, really probably unique uh, uh, to America. But in this particular um, passage, he says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, and, and in our uh, following of Jesus, um, we've received his name. How have we received his name? We are called Christians, right? Do you remember where that first happened? Yeah, yeah it's happened in, in, in Acts. We have, we have it recorded in Acts chapter 11, 25 through 26. Uh, and... Um, Actually, sometimes the name Christian was used as a way of mocking people. You know, it started out more of a, a, a criticism or a mocking, but the Christians were, they weren't offended. They were honored. Yes? Okay. Yeah, that, that comes with a change in cultures. Uh, it can be used as a, a, a name that that mocks people. Um, it says in verse 25, Acts chapter 11, so Barnabas went to, to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. So the followers of Jesus uh, claimed that name, and we've been called that uh, for 2,000 years. What does it mean in practical terms, uh, what Paul is teaching here, in verse 17, what does it mean in practical terms to take the name of Jesus today? What do you get from that? What does it mean to take the name of Jesus? Is somebody you know? So that we will be known, that we are Christ-like? Okay, all right. What else does it mean? Part, we are disciples? Oh, back there, way back there. We do things in his name by his authority. There, there's a, some importance to the, 
the teaching here of uh, doing everything in the name of Christ. First, if we're going to do something in his name, we should make sure it's what? <laughs> that he would approve it. Yes, Jimmy? Okay, this is an important idea. The name glorifies God. In this particular case, it glorifies Jesus. Assuming what? <laughs> We're doing what he's asked us to do, yes? It also specifies who we belong to. It specifies who we belong to. Uh, this is one of the things that, that people ask me, especially being in a foreign country, because the phrase in Romans 16.16 16 in English is, the churches of Christ greet you or salute you. But in other countries, it may be translated uh, differently. It may be translated, Christ's church greets you, okay? Uh, and so they'll always ask, why do you say uh, churches of Christ? Uh, and I simply say, because it shows who we belong to, that we are Christ's church. And they get that. They can understand that. It seems like a simple name. We're not named after a man. We're not named after a doctrine. Uh, we're named after the person uh, whom we are following. Uh, and so uh, we act with the approval of, of Jesus. We're doing those things he would want us to do. And it, it means uh, to do only that which Jesus himself uh, could endorse. Um, you know, one time I had needed to have a Bible study with somebody. And the only place I could locate them was a tavern. Okay, and so I'm coming up the door and I'm thinking, hmm, who's going to see me going into this tavern? Mm -hmm. um, but I went, um, and if someone saw me, I, I hoped they would ask me, because I was going in there with the purpose of sharing the word of God with them. And so all that we do should be consistent with his character. One of the, the great things about being resurrected is that the Bible is not primarily a rule book. It's not simply a list of do's and don'ts. The new person's lifestyle comes from the character of Jesus. We do what Jesus did. We're not uh, worshiping a book. We're not worshiping a church. We're worshiping a person. Jimmy? So sometimes Jesus did those things, which people might criticize, but in fact was consistent with his reason to come. He was a physician and he came to, the, to help the sick. The, so we have first, we will act with the approval of Jesus. Second, it means to do only that which Jesus himself uh, would endorse. And thirdly, uh, to do everything in the name of Jesus also means to act uh, in his authority. Uh, for example, we have... Uh, a common practice that when we pray, we end with what? In Jesus' name. What if you said a prayer and you didn't say in Jesus' name? Okay, okay. <laughs> the point of saying in Jesus' name is we show through whom the prayer goes. And we're showing honor and glory and submission to him. Um, you know, but it, if you're about to have an accident and to hit a semi truck and you forget to say in Jesus name, I'm pretty sure God heard that prayer. <laughs> okay, so it has a stronger purpose. Yes, Debbie. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to look at it. I was once standing in a circle with Christians and it was late. We've been together a long time and we were taking turns. The guys leading a prayer and we got around to one guy. They didn't go. We all opened our eyes, which is not a sin, by the way. We all opened, <laughs> we all opened our eyes, and we realized, oh, he's sleeping. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> we just moved on. So, but the idea here is the one who receives and answers our prayer. He's our advocate. He's the one between us uh, and and the Father, and he's the one whose authority um, that we act under. And so, this is where. Um, Paul was leading and talking about the application. Uh, but the last thing we've already mentioned uh, is that when we pray in his name, we're praising him. He's receiving the honor. He's getting uh, the glory, and that's something that we want to do. Okay, so Lord willing, 
Um, we shall continue in verse uh, 18. Uh, Peter said, as we close, 1 Peter 4, verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we can say, uh, when, when people see um, that the congregation, the church, or individuals are, are doing a great work, we thank God for that. Uh, we praise him for that. Okay, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we've been together, for this opportunity uh, to look at um, Paul's letter to the Colossians. We ask for wisdom as we take these ideas and seek and find ways to apply them. We want to always praise you and honor you, and so we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, persons.